Welcome to the Resilient Recruiter Podcast. This is your host, Mark Whitby, and I'm excited to be joined today by Ed Steer. Ed is the founder of Sphere, a multi-award winning digital media, marketing, and technology firm with offices in London and New York. Founded in 2012, they work with businesses like Amazon, TikTok, Facebook, many more famous brands, as well as innovative uh, tech startups. And in just 10 years, they've grown from zero to 10 million in net fees. Ed, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Mark. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So you were referred by Nick Eves, who's a, a great guy. I'm grateful He's to him indeed. for putting us in touch. How do you know Nick? Uh, it's really cool, actually. So Nick and I met on an APSCO trip to New York. It was an APSCO trade delegation in February 2017. And um, we had a week there scoping out the US market. Um, and we really hit it off. There's a few people on the trip who I've kept in contact with. And actually, consequently, we've all set up businesses in New York with Sphere being the last one, which I'm really glad for, actually, because I could basically just say to Nick, hey, dude, um, who's every single good lawyer, office provider, et cetera, et cetera, you found and uh, not have to do very much research. So, um, so oh, yeah, yes. so we, we, we met in the New York trip and then we've kept in touch. Our offices are close. And yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. Not, not not competing businesses, but lots of similar uh, values. So it's been a good, good, good connection. Oh, that's amazing. And I'd love to talk about your expansion into the US. And um, Anne Swain has been on the show, actually, representing APSCO. Um, was she on that trip or? She was. She was the yeah. chair. She's, as your listeners who've heard Anne will know or people who've met her, she's just an absolute... Um, yeah, brilliant personality. She's like dynamite, isn't she? She's such a whirlwind of energy and, and, and flies the recruitment flag so so brilliantly. So yeah, I'm a huge, huge, uh, huge fan of Ant. Me too. That's uh, that's for sure. All right, awesome. I mean, I have so much I want to ask you. We might, Ed, need to make this a two-parter because like, there's so many things that you've accomplished that I'd love to hear, to learn more about. But um, first, like, why did you start Sphere and, you know, Tell me that story of of the business inception. Yeah, I think I think it's um, it's funny. I think I can remember why, but it was kind of like um, it was ten years ago now, and and, and my motivations have obviously shifted as, as the business has grown. So um, I had an amazing career. I worked for one organisation called Aspire straight from university. I spent seven years there, and I loved it. I you know I bled the company. I was first in, last out. All the cliches. Um, I thought they ran the business brilliantly and I had an amazing time there. Um, I think I was just very, very, very ambitious and without being really crass, um, I wanted to turn hundreds of thousands into millions personally. And um, you can't do that. Um, you can't do that working for, well, it's hard to do that working for someone. So, um, so yeah, I, uh, I, I, I think that was for kind of the under, this underlying kind of desire to, have what I thought I could have if I created a really good company. Um, and then I was very lucky. So I met a girl at work, not Sphere, I hasten to add, that'd be completely unprofessional, <laughs> um, but at, at, at Aspire. She's called Carrie and she's now my wife. And and her dad happened to have built and sold a very big recruitment company. Uh, it was called Harrison Willis. It had kind of 250 staff. Um, so it was a big firm. He sold it in the late 90s and he went on to buy a zoo. So he was kind of like 42, had a big exit. Uh, didn't know what to do, but he kind of bought bought a zoo and theme park, which he's owned since the late nineties, <laughs> which, which is a whole other podcast. Wow, um, that's not what I was expecting. Yeah, zoo so is I met him. Z O O is in where you have animals. Correct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plug Drusilla Zoo Park, the best the best small zoo in um in Europe. It's it's brilliant. But so he he bought that, and you know, he's done an amazing job. Um, you know, run, running a complete you know, it's a tourist attraction. He he and the family have run for for twenty five years now. So the other side of the story is he was my wife's dad. Um, I was 24 and said to him, I want to set up a company and he's very high on accountability. So I was kind of like, shit, I've told him I'm going to do it. I've got to do it. So right. I, I, I had someone kind of holding my feet to the coals to actually resign and take the plunge. But but also, and I'm sure we'll come on to sort of what one of the reasons why Sphere has been successful. That's a, that's a massive factor in it because, um, yeah, he... Uh, he really did um, give me all the tools pre-launch to make sure that we grew. We, we started with growth in mind. And I was very naturally like that too, in terms of, you know, I didn't want to just have a business. I wanted to have a big and global business. It was never kind of, you know, get to 10 people and make some feet. I always 
wanted it to become, you know, you know, a, a really a really reputable organisation that endures beyond my tenure. Um, but yeah, having having met Lawrence and having had his um, input into me pre-launch, and then he became our non-exec director. That was um, invaluable. Wow. Okay. Fantastic. And uh, so it's been ten years now. I think you have how many employees have you got? Is it sixty or about about seventy? Yeah, give 70. Or take. Okay. yeah seventy. Yeah. Fantastic. And um, what were the kind of key milestones in that in that journey? Like, I imagine the first year is completely different to to how you run the business now so like looking back yeah. over over that 10 years can you walk me through like the high points and some of the low points absolutely so i think first 15 months were brilliant we launched in october 2012 so we kind of had a three month run of the business with niall who's my um, co-founder um and then 2013 was kind of like year one proper so by the end of the first year we turned over we didn't do any contract we turned over um, about 900k uh, and we had a team of seven or eight people um, and we'd made 250 grand in profit and we'd signed some incredible clients because to be honest kind of my reputation and existing clients um, you know, all, all returned and we signed some new ones and we were really niche and really specialists we won best newcomer at the marketing and advertising recruitment awards and we were you know a business who punched way beyond our years and our size we took the decision at the end of the first year to um, to take a, a lease on an office. So we were very quick to move out of serviced offices and we took a took a space of 30 people in Kingsway. And at the end of the first year's trading, I really knew that um, I was the managing director at the time as my job title. Um, and I really knew that I had to build the management team. When, when I left my old job, the team was doing about 1.6 million. It was about nine or 10 people. And I didn't really have a management structure beneath me that was robust. So. Going into year two, we moved into the offices and I really got to work on building a management team and we had very ambitious plans to, to, to grow. Um, and I was the top biller in the first year and halfway through year two, I was the top biller. And it's not like I made a conscious decision to retire, um, but um, we'd just grown by that point to being about 16, 17 people. And my job very quickly, I was good at adapting, was really about growing the management team and, and thinking about, you know, how the organisation could continue to expand. Um, and actually, the floor below became available in the building we're in. And, and Lawrence, NED, said, you need to take that. And I was like, well, there'd be space for 80 people and there's only 20 of us, give or take. That feels like a big, taking a big plunge. And he said, look, you'll need the space. It's a five-year lease. Um, go for it. So we, we, took, we took the floor below as well. Um, and they were big decisions because we were always really investing in our in our future and in, and in scalability. Um, so yeah, to go through the end of year two, we ended up with about 20 people, uh, had won more awards and we had the makings of our first management team. And then in that year, which was year three for us, I remember we had a board meeting and, and, and we'd kind of outsourced finance and it wasn't good enough. Um, and Lawrence said, you need to bring finance in house. And we interviewed for some finance managers really and I kind of thought we'd want you know just a bookkeeper and we interviewed lots of financial controllers and none of them I thought were brilliant and my my younger brother Ben is bright as a button he went to um, Bath and did straight economics is mathematically um, like supremely talented and he worked in um, in the city uh, and was way overqualified to be Sphere's accountant um, but I said to him and I was very mindful as well because he's my younger brother and I'm very proud of his you know, his achievements. But I kind of said to him, come and be our financial controller and manage a credit controller and an office manager who was also the marketing manager, you know, typical story. Um, and, and, and it really could become something. And, and that was strategically so important. Ben's now our chief operating officer um, and, and he runs, um, well, he's our chief operating officer. So finance now reports to him with a financial controller talent, marketing, operations, contract management. Um, so, but, but Ben was a real coup because he has just brought such big business thinking to Sphere um, and strategically is incredible. And he really does run the company so brilliantly financially. I was always strong at business planning and strong at strategic thinking, but Ben's just reinforced that so much and reinforced that with incredible data 
Um, and when it comes to things like deploying technology or launching in America or you know growing our country, you know we were we only kind of launched contract in year four, but understanding contract recruitment that I didn't, you know, he 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 just got his head around all of it and uh, um, and and has been such a fantastic addition. So. I've described it probably quite a long way there, kind of naught to three years and naught to 30 people. But our growth was always very organic. It was kind of like grow by 10 heads a year, grow by a million and a bit turnover a year and, and promote from within. Um, so I'll do the next bits in bigger phases. The next bit was kind of 30 to 50 people. Um, and that was hard, actually. It was hard for me personally because I was no longer running teams. So I was a really loved being a billing manager um, and it was a job that I was good at and then as the company grew and I grew the management team I really removed myself from the teams and what I learned was you know it's really hard to cascade down ways of working and values when you're working through managers and because we've always had homegrown talent we've always, always been asking people actually with limited experience to produce great results and that's that takes time so I think I had to learn patience and I had to learn um that things wouldn't always go perfectly. So I think being honest, in that first three years, there just wasn't even a you know a missed a missed month. It was just, you know, everything happened exactly as we intended. And I, c- I couldn't even remember the specifics around what didn't happen as we intended. But as we went from 30 to 50 people, we did experience churn and things did go wrong. And I think just for me personally, that was a real adjustment just in terms of right stuff, stuff does go wrong. And um managing through managers is is harder than just you know, jumping in and doing everything. Um, so, yeah, 30 to 50 people, I think, whilst we were very successful, we did that quickly on the outside and we can present that as a very successful story. Personally, I found that period period tough. Um, and that was kind of through to kind of years five or six. And then the next part of the business, I'll just take through to COVID. So I'd say years kind of five to eight, six to eight, we, we, we kind of, really stabilized as a kind of 65 person, seven million pound turnover organization. We opened a Manchester office and we did grow and we grew our revenue, but actually I think that was more just growing up, you know, more infrastructure came in, more technology came in, the management team grew up, we developed levels of management. So we had a leadership team really emerge and a um, yeah, leadership team emerged and a second generation management emerged. Um, and we became a very strong and a very robust business. But actually, also, we were probably guilty of growing for growing sake. And we were looking at some of the wrong metrics. So we were quite headcount and turnover driven. And whilst we spoke about NFI and we looked at our profitability, um, we never really focused on it. And whilst that's a good thing, because we've never been hugely focused on profit, because we've really wanted to invest and grow the business um, and not take short term profit led decisions. Actually, having gone through COVID and really re-looked at the business, we are aware that we need to grow and scale and 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 maintain our profitability and our margins because that's a sign of a good that's a sign of a good organisation and a robust one. So COVID was naturally really shit when it happened, um, and um, we'd actually just signed the lease on this beautiful office which I'm in on the day be- the Friday before Boris said work from home Friday the thirteenth of oh, March. No. We signed a lease on a you know very big premises at a very big rate, which required a very big fit out. So at the beginning of COVID, we had two offices and one of them we had to spend a quarter of a million pounds fitting out. So that was a scary moment, actually. Um, but yeah, nonetheless, it's, you know, it's, it's played out brilliantly. And I think coming out of COVID, we just got to say eight incredible years of growth and what really matters. And that was... Um, you know, launching in America, the contract business, the European business, and then having this kind of powerhouse in UK perm and really going back to the basics, hiring great talent, hiring youth, playing to our strengths of brilliant training, brilliant career progression, um, and really knowing that if we um, yeah, stick stick to our principles, we could create something very special. Um, and, the, and, the, and the growing needed to be at the benefit of the business. We wanted to kind of have leaner teams with higher revenue per head because actually we, we believe that makes people happier than over hiring and having less revenue per head and people generally not, you know, performing at the same level. So yeah, we just had a few, a few, a few sort of tweaks and rethinks uh, that have helped us emerge, you know, in, in, you know, from COVID in, in, in the best shape ever. Amazing. All right. That was a, 
I have asked that question a lot of times, and I think that was the most comprehensive answer I have ever received. At 130, <laughs> 130 plus episodes. So great job. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's good. It's good because it gives okay. me lots that I can follow up on. You talked about this transition. You enjoyed being, being a billing manager. And yes. Then you had to grow into really a business manager, managing through other managers. And that's the step that most entrepreneurs in this business, they never get that to that step, right? They kind of plateau at five to 10, maybe 12 heads. And, um, and they, they keep billing and that's great. And they have a lifestyle business. Uh, but you were very, very ambitious and you knew from the beginning that you wanted to build something uh, significant here. So what enabled you to, um, I guess it's your own personal growth more than anything, but what enabled you to level up and um, get good at that new job? Yeah, well, first of all, you, it does take time. And I think that's important to understand. We, we have progress in our career development plan. And I always say, you know, you, you start a new job and people don't really realize this, senior consultant, executive consultant, if, 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 if the career plan is good, um, it should have quantifiable expectations linked to that. Um, so, yeah, um, what enabled me to get good at that job? Well, look, I think I was very ready in terms of my career development before launching Sphere to be in some sort of probably commercial director type job where I was working through managers and um, and, 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 and overseeing business units. Um, but I hadn't done it. But I'd say if, I was in, if I'd stayed in my other company and the opportunity was there, that would, that would probably be my natural kind of where I was at. Um, like we just promoted someone to the board of Sphere, and she's absolutely there. And I'd say that's kind of where where I where I was at the point of starting Sphere. Um, you, you've got to really want to do it. The, the first thing I say to people who own any company or recruitment companies is, you, if you're the owner, you've got to know yourself and what you want because there's no point of saying we want to grow, we want to hire loads of people, if you're not committed to training people. And to really, really training people, and to really holding people to account, and to really investing in their development. So, if you're not willing to have really robust onboarding, really robust training to take people from consultant to senior consultant to executive consultant, and if you haven't got a big investment on how to become a billing manager from a training point of view, and if you haven't got a career development plan, if you're not, you know, operating in niche markets with specialization if you're not set up for growth you'll never grow um so i actually left my old company it's not on linkedin i left for six weeks and i went back after four years and i left and i joined a small business because i thought that would be helpful for me as i considered setting up a company and i joined a small company and it was a mess they had everyone had a different commission plan um the owner had you know another commercial director underneath him, but it was like five people in the organization. It was really close. There was no transparency. And I remember saying the company's not going to grow because there's no processes and there's no plans for growth. And he said, oh, we'll, we'll put that in place when we grow. And the reality is if you don't have it in place, you won't grow. Right. So yeah, it's a very long answer. Yeah, yeah. You, so my, to your point, how did I do that? Before I... I I, I, I knew that the company I left had 80 people in it, give or take, and I knew that they had these things that enable that to happen. So it was really a case of actually taking that playbook and, and, and rolling it out and, and knowing that you can't shortcut it. Um, so, yeah, you, you've got to be ready for growth and you can't grow reactively. You have to grow proactively. You have to say, we're going to do this. We're going to do it by this date. We're going to do it this way. And then you have to you have to stick to it. Okay, that's a great answer, but I'm going to push you – harder ed because the um the billing manager who wants to grow but at the same time they're the biggest biller yeah in the business what does that now is there is there a transition or is it just a leap of faith because they're they're thinking to themselves if i stop running a desk like we need that revenue, right? And, yeah, I, and yeah, yeah, yeah. the rest well, of the team hasn't. The team are doing okay, but they're not at my level yet. And if I, if I, you know, tr tr trust you know and enablement. Yeah, I know. It's, it's trust enablement. So if you hire people and if you train them, they will fill the jobs. 
Um, so I could build, let's say, you know, I could build 300K, let's say, good, 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 good billings um, for an owner, owner manager. I could build 300K. Um, I could hire two graduates and within four to five months, I could have them running at 15 grand a month, which is 180K times two is 360K. Um, and you're probably going to pay them 50 grand each, perhaps with bonus, depending on the commission structure. So you, you, as an individual, you can only generate so many fees. If you can enable others, you can grow a company. So I didn't make a decision to stop fee earning overnight. It was never a conscious decision. What would happen is roles would come through and I would think, I can't brief this out because running that training session is more important or interviewing for this open vacancy is more important or um, writing this plan is more important or supporting this up and coming manager is more important. So what happened is when the jobs came through, um, I would say, oh, uh, the guys on my team, Matt, um, Sam, whoever it was, I'd say, oh, can you take this one? Can you take this one? Can you take this one? And then six months later, I turn around and I just hadn't worked on a job for six months. So I was actually fiercely thinking, oh, when I do this and when I do this and when I do this and when I do this, I'm going to take on some roles again. And it just didn't happen. And in, in year three, the guy who ran our technology sales function, Matt, was on paternity leave. And um, we had a client briefing, and it was for a company, an Australian technology vendor, and they were launching in, um, in Europe. And we did um, a pitch, and Matt wasn't around, so I pitched for it and pitched for exclusivity, and that actually pitched for it retained. And the, the, the owner of the company said, okay, great, yeah, we'll retain you, we'll go with you guys if you can work on the job. And I sort of thought... Do you know what? I, I, I probably can. And I, I sat in the corner with the tech sales team, which is always the market I worked in, for two weeks and you know briefed out the job to everyone who I already knew uh, since my market. And it was great fun, and I and I, and I and I filled it, and that was really that was really enjoyable. But no, it, uh, to answer the question, I think for owner managers in that situation, it's very basic. It's about prioritization, and it's about enabling others, and it's not a hard stop. It's just about it's about passing things on. I've never worried with. Um, we're very customer obsessed. I never worry about giving a job to someone who's inexperienced and then not doing a good job because you can always apologize and people have to be trusted to learn. If you don't give people a chance to learn, they'll never get it. So we, we, we have always, always, always really trusted and given opportunity to people from like very early on in the business, coupled with lots of support and training. Ed, what you just said is pure gold because I think that is the stumbling block is the owner thinks, oh, well, she's not ready yet. She's only been here X number of time, amount of time, and this is a senior role and I can't give it to her because whatever. And you're saying if you don't give it to her, she's never going to rise to that level. So, you know, you're just uh, putting obstacles in the path of you growing. Yeah, and, and I've just never we've never said it's a senior candidate. So look, they can we can we can train them to ask these questions, um, yes. and we can call shadow and we can support. So yeah, we, yes. we've never and and you, and and you start off creating limiting beliefs in people. If you start off by yes. saying you need to be a resourcer for six months or you can't do senior yes. hires until you've been doing the job for two years, you're just you're just creating limiting beliefs. We're like crack on with our support, um, and then we also say to people, you know. Being new is a free pass. If you start every call saying, not like I'm an idiot, but say, look, hey, I've just, we hire lots of graduates and, and non graduates, but hey, this is me. I'm new to the role. Um, I, 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 um, I understand these things. I don't understand these things. So, what if it's okay with you? If I don't understand something, I might just qualify it a few times. If I make mistakes, please know it's done in good faith. It's like the most disabling thing in the world because as opposed to someone thinking this recruiter's got an agenda they just think i'm dealing with someone inexperienced it completely disables them and um there's a big advantage to it so yeah we just say to people don't try and fake it don't try and pretend something you're not be honest people will be understanding if they're not understanding the, you know, the majority of people are understanding the majority of people are nice um so yeah we, we yeah we just kind of really empower people to, to get on with it i love that so trust and enablement is is that a catchphrase in the business or not as such but i guess it's something that we talk about a lot yeah. yeah. And the, another phrase they used is progress. Is that an acronym or you said that's uh, your progress, development? That's our career development plan. Yeah. So could you describe that for us? Yeah. It's our career development plan. It caters for everyone from associate consultant through to, you know, director level and beyond. Um, it, uh, it's 
focuses on three areas, although the competencies change. So for recruitment people, the fee earning side of the business, the first part of progress is you as a recruiter. So again, that could be associate consultant, that could be director. And it looks at four areas. It looks at performance versus target, how you operate clients, how you operate candidates, and how you manage processes. Um, so for junior people, as an example, with clients, it's like learn how to open BD calls. For executive consultants, it's own customers who produce X amount of revenue and ensure that three or four other teams are introduced to and working with those customers. So the framework is the same, the competencies and the expectations change. So the first bit is you as a recruiter. The second bit is your role with your team. And that's all about how you own your own, um, yeah, the role you play in your team. So how you own your own um, shit, how you then um, help others to own theirs, how you support key company initiatives, how you work in line with our values. So that's you and your team. And the final bit is you and yourself. And that's really about how you take ownership of your own personal development. So although that is linked um, so if someone was exact, like as an example, if someone was our finance manager or our marketing manager, the first bit would be how they're performing in their job versus the criteria. Parts two and three, how you operate in the team and how you operate in terms of driving and leading your own personal development is universal across the company. Um, and then what that means is that everyone in the business always has um, a date for their next review, always knows um, when their next pay review is, always knows what the next available job is, always knows how to get there. So we have real transparency around career development. And again, I think that's really important and powerful um, and fair. And it's it's what I loved is you kind of just do each part. If you want to nail the objectives, you've got the competencies to nail the next ones and the next ones and the next ones. So it kind of really, it really rolls forward. Amazing. Do people get... Do people see the competencies that would be next in their uh, in their yeah, plan? So they you, you, you could you could you could you could it's completely transparent. So yeah. um, it's all documented. It's all available. You could go and look at what you have to be to be a director. The salary right. is transparent. Yeah, it's it's all awesome. it's all it's all completely transparent. Yeah, love it, love it. So the the other thing you mentioned was um, building a management team. <clears throat> this is another huge stumbling block because. Often what I hear, especially let's say um, you've you've hired people into the business and they've been with you anywhere from six months to 18 months and you want to keep hiring, but you've reached, you've, you can only directly manage so many people, right? So you need to create this layer and, and, and um, promote people, but they're not. And this is maybe the same thing as the empower, they're not good enough. <laughs> but they're not ready. That's the that's yeah. what I hear. It's like I, you know, Susie's, you know, really good. She's a good role model, but she's got no management experience, and she's she's not been she's only been with us, you know, X time. She's not ready for that next step yet. So I guess I just have to keep managing, you know, until we can bring on people who like mature people through the business, so they're they're ready. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a really tough one. So we do have a slight caveat, which is if we have a requirement for managers, sometimes we just put people in the job. So progress is like structured, but sometimes it's like we need a manager, we're going to back this person. Okay. So there is an element of backing people. <laughs> when it comes to management, people need to really want to do it for the right reasons, which is not yes. the kudos, it's the actual development of others. And generally, managers need to be people who are at a very minimum, good team players and who work in a scalable way. So anybody who I think, if you're to us, we're very niche. We're very much like stay in your lane. So if you feel these jobs with these clients, don't, 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 don't go rogue. So I think the best managers for us need to really reflect some of our corest of value. So if people have been in all place forward, right? If people have been well trained, if people have been trained versus a certain way of working, um, then, um, they will just roll that forward. So if you've been doing your job properly, if you've trained people in a good way, hopefully that sets you up quite well. And if the company's ways of working are clear. Um, but management has loads of levels to it. So we're very clear on the expectations of a new manager, mm -hmm. what we call team leader, versus the expectation of a manager. So team leader builds, leads from the front, does people's one-to-ones. 
but we wouldn't expect them to know how to do performance reviews or end of probation reviews or to um, do you know, progress reviews or to write a business plan. So we would say to a new manager, you need to build and not and don't stop, um, and you need to learn how to manage one person. Um, and then they're on that management path. But when it comes to doing an end of probation review or a progress review or, you know, setting a strategy for the team, the the more senior manager, which is usually the owner, it was, you know, it was me as I grew my management team, then I'd be doing that with them. But after 12 months, hopefully they've acquired the skill to do that. So you just need to put people in the role, in my view, if you think they're right, make the expectations clear and let them move one step at a time and not say, oh, you're a manager now, here's four people because right. that's going to go really badly. Absolutely. No, that makes total sense. Uh, that makes total sense. So um, you mentioned that. But it is really hard, by the way, the management thing. The yeah, managers. totally. It makes or breaks people. Totally. And I mean, would you ever, if someone tried it and it didn't work out, then what happens then? Yeah, we've had several people who've, who've stepped out of the role and come back into the business and stayed with us. Great. So, yeah, it's a tough awesome. conversation. But I think, I think, you know, people should place their strengths and, you know, there's a whole bring your natural self to work, which I really believe, like, do, do, do what you're good at, do what makes you happy. Totally. So you mentioned that 30 to 50 was particularly hard and you had a few things go wrong. Could you elaborate on what the things went, what things went wrong? It's actually what we've just spoken about. Like, okay. um, Lots of junior managers hiring lots of junior people probably too fast. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And maybe expanding the headcount when we didn't have the job flow to support it. Mm. Um, and then actually, because a lot of our best billers became managers, they stopped doing the business development, um, are stepped away from the business development, so yeah, just 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 generally, I think we've probably got we've done the growing, but we just didn't have the experience or the know how to to make it really as good as it was when we were ten people, twenty people, thirty people. But also, I wouldn't change that because that that was growing pains, and of that group of managers who are part of that journey, I wouldn't know the exact number percentage wise, but over 50% of that group are still with us and they're now the leadership team that run the company. So we had to go through it. Um, and I think if you put people into manager roles, if in three years' time you've got 50% of them still in your business, that's probably a good result. And if they are still in your business, I'm sure they'll be doing a very good job. But I do think the exit points in recruitment, new, don't like it. Two years in, have given it a go haven't kicked on um, is, a, is an exit point. And I'll say four to five years have been in the organisation doing recruitment for four to five years and, and again, aren't going to make the grade as either super biller or, or, or manager. Some people will say, I'm okay with this, but 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 most won't actually. Most, not the people we hire. We hire people who are really, really ambitious and in a company where everyone's moving forwards, if you have been there for four or five years and you've kind of plateaued, um, it, it, it's kind of a point for, again, healthy healthy exit. So, yeah, when we, we put people into that management job, um, it's the same. People either become brilliant managers and they really grow their team and they go on and they go on and they go on, or actually I think they become managers, billings plateau, they churn people a little bit and they, and they probably decide actually, you know, you can't, can't keep moving forwards. A great, great, great point. Um, so, what were the, when you realized this was happening, what did you do to turn it around? That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> back to basics, I think we sh did churn people um, a bit and that's a bit of natural selection perhaps as well, of just who's right, who's wrong. Um, and we did stick to our principles and we did keep doing the same things in terms of the things we've known made us successful, strong on training, strong on career development, strong on empowering people, strong on trust. I don't, I, so I think it was actually a sense that we all had two years more experience. I think it was a case of growing up. I really do. I think I'll just call it that. I don't know, we want to be self, I mean, we would have been being self-analytical at the time. 
But with, with, with hindsight, I do just think it was a case of we were an ambitious company who was growing and we had we were all in jobs where we were we'd never done them before and we were stretching right. ourselves. So I just think partly just we just grew up. Awesome. Tell me about launching in America. It's been great. Um, it's uh, it got pushed back because of COVID, which I think was probably a good thing as well. Because Dan, who's launched there, is you know a, to our point, aforementioned point, a year older. He's the grand old age of twenty eight now. Um, so um, yeah, it's been great. We, we we we're really strong within some particular niche forms of technology, and and most of those vendors are American companies. So yes. we've had the the um, the real benefit of from a business development point of view, having lots of active clients to go after. Um, Dan joined us as a graduate and has grown up kind of through Sphere and with the Sphere way. So he's really been able just to roll our values and our ways of working forward. Um, we've hired brilliant people who really have bought into our culture and our way of being. And um, so it's been great to kind of be an American company, but to have aligned so strongly with the people we've hired on values. Um, and it just reminds me of the first few years of Sphere, really, that really exciting bit of getting off the ground and winning business and, you know, all the placements really, really counting. Um, and then the differences for me personally, America's a long way away. So, you know, figuring out how to support Dan emotionally, really, when, when, when just physically not, not, not together. Um, and I think that's been very different for Dan because he grew up in London. He joined us when we had 30 people. So he was always in a big office. So, that adaptation of being in a smaller office is, is different. Um, we have a great plan there. And, 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 and really, it's just a case of doing the first three years of Sphere in America. Like we know, we, we know what desks, what market, what order. Yeah, we, we, so it's hard and also it's simple to, to, to know that we've got a plan and we, we just need to stick to it and, and, and make it happen. It's interesting because you have followed the playbook um, which I have observed to the companies that succeed at doing this, which is number one, you already had clients there. Mm -hmm. And number two, you sent one of your trusted people over, almost like the sending an evangelist over there to bring, you know, this this fear way of doing things and who's grown up and is like through and through his sphere values, processes, and so on. So it almost rather than if you'd hired someone who outside of Sphere to try and run that office for you, I don't think it would have worked in the same way. I, we would never do it. We, yeah. I know companies have done it. I'm not saying it's not, not achievable, but because we're so um, strong on values and ways of working, it, yes. it, it really wouldn't have worked for us. Yeah, yeah you're right. And I think that is a play. I'm, I know that um, Stanton House did that. I know several other companies who, who, who yeah, it, it, for us, it was the only option because when things are tough, if you don't know the person, you'd always be thinking, you know, is it the person? I don't know that right. they're in America. Whereas right. we, we know we know 100% we've got the right person. We've got complete and utter trust. Um, and like the, as I said, the evangelism and the playbook is in place. So, yeah, it's the, it's the only way we do it. And, and we will open more offices in America. And when we do, we will never go and hire someone in San Francisco or hire someone in Chicago. We will just look at the New York office and say, you know, who's the right person to, to go and do that. So that organic um, growth is, is always going to be the way we go about things. I mean, I, I know in the future it's, it's not in our roadmap today, but if we've got much, much, much bigger companies do acquire, um, we're, you know, I say we're some way off that, but I think, yeah, our style is very much organic growth because we've got such a strong playbook. Fantastic. Have you, needed to adjust your ways of working at all for a different country, different market, different culture? Not yet. Okay, great. Not yet. Um, um, not the ways of working. I think, I think it's probably less of a pub culture. I think Dan's, yes, struggling, for to find, sure. I think Dan's struggling to find someone to go for a beer with him on a Tuesday. Um, <laughs> that would be the main observation. No, we've always been... No, I think I think treating people well is kind of a universal thing, and because we work with lots of tech startups who are American, we've always had those kind of Americanisms going through the business anyway. I think. Um, so that was maybe just a natural fit anyway, based on your client base and and everything. Yeah, I think I think having a having a modern culture. So 
flexible working, working from home, empowerment, trust, responsibility, uh, all the things that good 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 workplaces offer. You know, we've we've, um, we've always we've um, we've been really focused on building diversity within our organisation for a long time. Um, yeah, so those I think those themes are are universal. Um, yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Uh, the reason I ask is because I know one company that I worked with for a long time um, expanded globally, and they had a really strong culture in the UK. Like that, it was the culture, the values, everything was um, was one of their reasons they were successful. And then they exported that to Amsterdam, and it pretty much it, it fit in Amsterdam. Then they exported that to Germany, and it it. They had to make some concessions or some tweaks to the like the, the ways of working to KPIs, etc. Pardon me? Being KPI led. Yeah, well that's one for sure. That's one. And then the Singapore, it was it completely different, uh, like from Europe. Uh, and they had to really make some uh adjustments in, in Singapore. Yeah, Germany did, we, we work in Germany from London with English yeah. people. <laughs> okay. So so our German team works in the same way because we're doing it from London. But we know that that's a good, something that Dan struggled with has been, which we have experienced in Germany, but he hadn't because he was on our UK teams, was um, in America, there's a lot of sending resumes to talent acquisition teams who then reach out to the candidate, book the first interviews and manage the process. So oh. Dan's found that really hard. He's like, you know, I just send CVs. And then the talent acquisition teams take it forward. And he's like, that's, he, he, he really hates us. I hate the sound like, of that. That's not. Yeah, uh... he's like, yeah, we have that in Germany. So he's, he's really not like that. Yeah. I don't, so I don't like, think that's universally. I, I, I would, if I was Dan, I'd be, um, I'd be, I'd be pushing against that because we have a lot of, in fact, 55% of our clients are, are American and, um, I know that that happens, uh, what what you've just described, but I don't think that it has to be the way it, uh, it, stop it works. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah, exactly. In the briefing, yeah. So, so um, no, I think I think the most the biggest cultural adapt- adaptations have probably been for Dan and his personal life, as opposed yeah. to the, the, the work side of things. Yeah, I know that makes sense. Um, looking back over the last ten years, um, what was the biggest learn or the thing that you, if you could go back to the younger Ed Steer and give him mm-hmm. advice, what would it be? Weirdly, don't compromise on the things that I really care about from a values point of view, because um, I, I, I had to learn to be more flexible and to adapt to other people and how they like to work. That's a good thing. But I also had some things that I really believed in. And as the company grew and grew and grew, I think I probably compromised on too many of those things because it's hard to um it's hard to it's hard to make sure those ways of working really endured. But I think when it came to the management team, I needed to really say, which I do say now, that this is how you have to operate as a manager. If you don't want to operate like this, then you're not a bad person and we're not a bad company, but this is this is not this is not going to be for you so i think i just had to develop i wish i'd just done that um the whole way through because i am you know very sensitive on values and i know i said earlier setting up the company was about the success of it but actually i do have really strong beliefs around what creates excellence and what creates great work what companies to work with and for so i think i needed to kind of make sure i was always led by those and in terms of what stops you doing that it's it's kind of the fear you know you, the company ends up costing hundreds of thousands of pounds to run every month and you know, you're, uh, you're trying to keep up with all the targets that you set. So I think, yeah, I've just made probably a few, few too many compromises. Can you give a specific example of like something that you did believe in and you kind of let it go and then you decided, yeah, no, maybe, actually. Without naming names, the main one would be really basic stuff, but just like all teams need to operate as specialists. So yes. we don't want desks where they're reactive to, you know, all these jobs got phoned through. So we're just having a crack at them because my belief is, Whilst you can make money doing that, it fundamentally stops you building things. You don't build uh, candidate communities. You don't build um, really deep relationships with customers where you're known for being experts. 
And if a job stopped getting phoned through, you've got absolutely bugger all to fall back on when it comes to a proactive nature. So there are a couple of teams that weren't directly led by me where they were quite reactive to what got phoned through. Um, and I would have, with hindsight, just said from the get-go, actually, that's just not going to work and we're not, we're not doing it. Excellent. Yeah, no, I, I agree 100% philosophically with that. Um, and it's a conversation we have with our clients every day where they're struggling with it because they, they see the benefit of being a niche specialist, but they've got these legacy accounts or, but what if they phone in and it's a really good role and, you know, and, and yet you're, you know, it is retained and I could fill it. Uh, but is it building the direction you want to go? And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get, you know, get uh, buy into that sometimes. Yeah, and it's not, cause we're, we're, if I gave all our war stories about the clients we have worked with, it was exactly that. We might have, you know, our best clients say, can you fill this role? Very simple, no, that's not our market. Yes. Um, and, and, and if and when it is, you know, we'll let you know. So I always just said, you know, stick, stick, stick to your guns about what you do do, because in the long run, you know, everyone talks about it, inch wide, inch wide, mile deep yeah, mentality and focus, focus, focus. Um, yes. So yeah, I think, I think they are the things that I kind of, allowed to happen because you've kind of got bigger priorities and bigger fish to fry and it just about works but you end up with people you know, not not working in line with the values and the systems that we've set out so you know that that would be my one my one regret i think yeah no definitely that makes sense um just in the last few minutes we have available ed um you've mentioned building communities which is something that i really believe in and i think that you know we've just had a massive like hiring um, boom over the last 18 months. And there's going to be a correction sooner or later where, and you know, some tech companies are already seeing that with layoffs and things. Yeah. We have done yeah, job flows dropped by 15 out of, um, yeah, it's, it's been a hit over the last eight weeks for sure. Eight weeks. Okay. And dropped by how much? Uh, percentage wise, 10%. Okay. Well, my, my, my belief, and this certainly was true over COVID, my belief is that if instead of being a vendor with clients or candidates, you have developed a community where you are a leader within that community and you are bringing people together, sharing ideas, bringing value to that community that you, you serve, then you have a much more sustainable and robust or resilient to use the word of this podcast you've got a more resilient business that um when trading conditions are not as favorable you're you've got some protection because you've got you've it's not just a client relationship it's almost more than that where um you have people around you who really trust you and they perceive you as more than just a recruiter um, mm -hmm. how have you guys gone about building those communities? Yeah, thank you. So it's something, again, I'm really, really passionate about. So a uh, data segmentation. So everyone who goes onto the database being well-coded, we've never used parsing tools because whilst, um, uh, whilst they do work at picking up keywords, they can pick out the wrong keywords. So we've, we've really disciplined on, on coding every candidate, every client, as in, uh, contact so every candidate every contact and every job we're, we're really strict around what codes people can use um i won't bore you with that but that's that's we don't have a billion codes yeah. uh, they're very logical and, and and those and we also use those as our placement codes so complete consistency across coding which is really simple uh, that makes searching for candidates very simple it makes searching for similar jobs very simple um, but what it also meant is from a marketing and outreach point of view we could create relevant content and share it with a community so um, having great data segmentation has meant that we're quick to find candidates for our jobs. We're, we're able to every single month do really cool outreach to each community with relevant content. So we've been doing content marketing since before content marketing was a word. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and that's really enabled us to build communities. What well, started out with good content marketing uh, evolved into events. So we'd say to those customers, we used to sponsor lots of events, we'd say, hey, We'd like to be on the panel, so we started to create events within each community. Um, in COVID, I launched a, a podcast, um, which centers around those communities as well. So, yeah, basically, segment data, have expert consultants, absolutely shitloads of content marketing to each community. All right, awesome. And uh, what's so that's a really succinct um roadmap, but it's uh, it 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 makes sense. What uh, what's been the most successful? 
type of event that you've run? Uh, we just host uh, last one was women in, women in ad tech, and we had um, we did it in conjunction with Bloom UK, which is a, a, a mentoring scheme um, for, for women in, in ad tech. And um, we had a panelist, um, several panelists, a chair, uh, and then we invite our customers in, and we had like you know fifty to sixty clients in our office, and then from there, new business always comes up the back of it, um, and we run those once a quarter. So yeah, we we, we actually just. Um, we actually have a relationship with a PR agency who does PR for the same technology vendors that we do recruitment for. Oh, so perfect. the PR agency gets their clients on our panels, but we don't have to arrange the panels. So we, we host them in our offices because it's a good space. Yeah. Because of the aforementioned good data segmentation, we're really good at filling a room. And then we just say to the, the PR agency, put your clients on our panels and we'll, we'll, we'll host it and fill the room. Um, so, yeah, they, they work really well. Amazing. And are those uh, do are your events aimed mainly at clients or candidates or mixture? One in the same, really. We just we okay. just um, we we invite, just invite um, yeah. people from those communities. Yeah, we invite we invite yeah. recognised clients, and then we invite candidates. And we, it's a bit crude, but we probably invite people. I don't know what, what our marketing team do, but perhaps anybody who's on over eighty k or something like that gets right. Get, right. Get, get, gets an invite. I'll tell you the one inhibition that because I've floated this idea to a few clients and one reservation is but you're putting your clients and candidates in the same room some of those people are going to meet each other and they'll hire like you have facilitated the introduction but you're not going to get a placement fee what's oh, your so what take I, on yes, that yes yeah, so i i I'm probably we've probably missed out on loads of money over the years I, I have such good goodwill and good faith so um and i'm not ever bothered about it so i said well for, you know we, we never actually chase things like, it probably sounds a bit daft really, but we never chase finders fees if they're vaguely contentious. If there's CV wranglings, I'll, I'll always say that we're going to step away from that one because I just think the angst and the bother is not worth the 10, 15, 20,000 um, pounds. So I think that doesn't make us a soft touch. And what I really try and get into the business phase philosophically, I know consultants might feel really miffed about that, but like, about ten thousand pounds, you might make a thousand pounds, or two thousand pounds, or three thousand pounds in bonus, um, but that's not going to change your life. And actually, if you can think about the bigger picture and ways of working that really work for the long term, that are really sustainable, you'll win bigger in the long run. So we have a really big picture, long term view on not worrying about losing out the odd fee here or there. Beautifully said. And on that note, I think we'll wrap it up there, Ed. That was fantastic. Thank you for sharing your you know, 10 year journey and so many good golden nuggets and, and uh, learnings. So that was awesome. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Really enjoyed it.